Hi, and welcome to The Gist. Health, as they say, is the greatest wealth because without it, we can't achieve any of our goals, care for our loved ones, or contribute to society. Of course, one of the biggest contributors to health is our diet, but information on food can be confusing and contradictory. So let's get back to the basics on food and see how we can incorporate healthy eating into our daily lives. Where the science of food is concerned, what's become increasingly clear is how little we truly understand nutrition. Even the entire concept of calories, so widely used in determining diets, is imprecise and likely long past its usefulness. Also, the historical push for many vitamins and supplements appears to have been influenced less by science than by commercial interests. The food pyramids and recommended daily intakes that governments have been promoting since the 1960s are also outdated and based on very poor science. As one example among many, the debate over whether fats, especially animal fats, are healthy or not has been reopened and the science is far from being settled. Amidst such confusion, we can still rely on some basics that have brought us this far without the risk of extinction. That is, for reasonably good health, we need to focus on eating food, sleeping until we're rested, and keeping our bodies in motion, typically as part of daily activities. It may seem preposterous, an oversimplification even, but if you think about it, that's all we need to do from a biological perspective. It's also what most other animals do, and are we really so different from them after all? The journalist and author Michael Pollan coined a pithy phrase that captures the essence of his dietary philosophy. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. He recommends that we eat food that's recognizable as food, not made up of reconstituted or fortified nutrients. For most of us, there's no need to fortify our foods unless we're malnutritioned. Pollen says that one easy way to eat real food is cooking our own meals and eating them as a formalized family ritual that can support good habits. We can expand on Pollen's philosophy with evidence from other sources to arrive at the following core principles. For a start, studies have shown that the quality of food that we eat is as or more important than the quantity, and that the greatest benefits may accrue from eating mostly whole grains, fruits, and vegetables, and limiting red meat, saturated fats, and sugar. In terms of fats, we should aim to get most of our fats from nuts, legumes, and other sources of unsaturated fats. If environmental impact is a factor in our food choices, then reducing meat and dairy appears to be the single biggest way for an individual to mitigate their own impact on the environment. Overall, it's better to focus on moderation rather than elimination because completely cutting out certain foods is hard to achieve on a practical level. The focus should be on changing our diet rather than on dieting. For one, dieting has consistently been shown to be unsustainable. Most people quickly regain the weight they lose from dieting. Additionally, it's next to impossible for the average person to burn more calories through exercise than they consume through food. The less refined a food, the less added sugar it has, so the fewer calories it's likely to add to our diet. Whole, unprocessed foods also have the added benefits of retaining nutrients and being digested more slowly in our bodies, helping to better manage blood sugar levels. That said, most processed, ready-made foods, even ones from the restaurants, play on our weaknesses for sugar, fat, and salt. While our bodies need these things, it may be that they were not as readily available for most of our existence and thus we consumed less of them. Today, they're abundant with almost unfettered access, and recipes are engineered to optimize the levels of these ingredients so that we acquire an almost insatiable taste for foods that contain them. In other words, they're addictive. Thus, even the most strong-willed amongst us will be hard-pressed to resist the temptation of a sweet or savory snack, 
a rich, moist chocolate cake, or a salty bag of potato chips. So the best way to avoid temptation is to not give in ourselves the opportunity to indulge in the first place. And one way to do this is by simply not buying such snacks. For most people, the effort it takes to go out and buy such foods when they feel a craving will probably be too much. So we're more likely to eat whatever else is on hand. And if what we have on hand is nuts and fruits, it will help us build a more sustainable dietary habit to the point that we're satisfied and don't miss the junk food we may once have loved. Over time, we could also learn to make healthier versions of our favorite junk foods at home, even involving children and other family members. We may develop new rituals that in the long term will benefit everyone who's involved in them. One particularly bad habit we modern humans seem to have is late night snacking. With our busy, always on lives, we often skip meals during the day. So it's little wonder that we crave food at night. However, several studies have shown that eating late night snacks or even eating dinner within three hours of bedtime can have a whole host of unwanted effects such as heartburn or acid reflux. A 2023 British study of 850 adults found that people who snacked after 9 p.m. had higher levels of HbA1c, a measure of diabetes risk, and larger blood sugar and fat spikes compared to those who did not eat late. Carbohydrates in particular contribute to such spikes, according to Erin Hanlon, a behavioral neuroscientist at the University of Chicago, in part due to the presence of melatonin a sleep-producing hormone that increases in the evenings and dampens insulin production. Robert Lustig, an endocrinologist and researcher, has been leading the charge against processed food and in particular sounding alarm bells about sugar. He argues that fructose is the worst culprit amongst sugars. While our bodies need and use glucose in energy production, Fructose is largely not necessary for survival and actually inhibits enzymes that are essential for metabolic regulation. Because fructose is added to so many processed foods to improve palatability, it's easy for our bodies to get overwhelmed by it. Our livers metabolize fructose, but when we eat too much of it, it's stored in our livers as fat, which can lead to fatty liver disease as well as chronic metabolic disease and insulin resistance. This has led to a staggering increase in type 2 diabetes globally. While the media often focuses on rising obesity, Lustig says that much less attention is paid to the underlying cause, which is the increase in metabolic dysfunction caused by our diets. Unfortunately, there are no quick fix diets that will help us drop weight and suddenly become healthy eaters. Like most things that are worthwhile, we must commit to learning as much as we can about food and getting the basics of our food habits right. Eating well requires establishing good lifelong habits that underpin our food choices. So spending some time understanding our own eating patterns and starting with small changes can get us on the right path. That doesn't mean that we can't indulge in our favorite sinful treats once in a while, but the more thought and attention we put into creating healthy meals, the tastier they become and our bodies get into a virtuous cycle of craving more healthy food. On that note, wishing you a great week ahead, be well, and see you next time on The Gist.